we would request everyone to please take their seats audience please be seated audience please be seated A very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all the respected session chairs, esteemed, esteemed session speakers, respected faculty members, invited guests, conference participants and our fellow students to this symposium of the International Conference for Climate Change Global Cooperation organized by St. Xavier's College Autonomous Kolkata. We, Ayana Mukherjee and Somil Basu are your hosts for this session. If humanity has to live for a long time, you have to think like the earth, act as the earth, and be the earth, because that is what you are. Remembering these lines by Sadhguru and following his words, we work towards sustenance and the betterment of our environment. We are honored to have with us today, Dr. Purnyaslok Bhaduri, our esteemed speaker for the current session. We also welcome the chairperson for this respective session, Dr. Sanjeev Ganguly. We request both of you to please come up on the stage and take your seats. Our chairperson for the session, Dr. Sanjeev Ganguly, is an associate professor, Department of Chemistry at St. Xavier's College, Autonomous, Kolkata. He did his PhD from IACS, Kolkata, under the supervision of Professor Animesh Chakravarti. His areas of research interest include metal-mediated chemical transformation, spin-state interaction of redox-sensitive coordination moieties, coordinated radicals stabilization and electron transfer pathways. He has many paper publications under him and is a valuable asset of our respected institution. We take this opportunity to felicitate Dr. Sanjeev Ganguly on behalf of everyone present and to show our gratitude. So, we would also request you to kindly introduce our respected speaker, Dr. Punya Shlok Bhaduri. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. So, let me introduce the speaker, Professor uh, Punya Shlok Bhaduri. Professor Bhaduri completed his MSc from Edinburgh and PhD from Plymouth in the United Kingdom. Subsequently, he did his postdoctoral research from Princeton, Univer Princeton University, USA. He joined as an assistant professor at Isa Kolkata in 2009. And from 2018 onwards, he is a full professor of biological sciences at the Isa Kolkata. He has established, he has established and also leads the Center for Climate and Environmental Studies, an interdisciplinary center on earth and environmental sciences with societal relevance in the Isa Kolkata. He is also leading a new interdisciplinary center, Center for Excellence in Blue Economy in Isa Kolkata. He is the recipient 
of the prestigious Sharno Jayanti Award in the area of Earth and Environmental Sciences conferred by the Government of India in 2019. He has published more than 90 papers in peer-reviewed international journals. He is the editor and also in editorial boards of several journals, including Geoscience Letters, Journal of Ecological Solutions and Evidence, Journal of Genetics, and Scientific Reports. His research interests include unraveling biocomplexity of organismal systems, biogeochemical cycling of carbon in mangroves, quantifying impacts on coastal ocean acidification and rise in sea level, as well as monitoring health of oceans based on automation. He is one of the contributing authors of the Second World Ocean Assessment of United Nation. He, he was one of the panelists on changing climate, coastal ocean, and adaptation in COP26 held in Glasgow. He also co-chairs the Regional Advisory Committee of the Asia Oceania Geosciences Society, coordinator of the South Asia Regional, Health, Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification, working group member of Global Soil Partnership of the United Nations, and part of the writing team of United Nations Law of the Sea. He was also the team leader in India's Arctic expedition winter phase in 2010. So with this brief introduction, may I now request Professor Vaduri to deliver his invited lecture. So we would also like you to felicitate Dr. Bhaduri on behalf of all of us. We kindly request Dr. Ganguly to steer the session proceedings forward while we await the unraveling of an extremely insightful and academically enriching discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, Professor Mitra, uh, Professor Ganguly, and colleagues. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, it's great to uh, listen to speakers encompassing different areas uh, from fundamentals of changing climate to what it means for the communities. Um, what I'll do in the next 40 minutes is I'm going to cover something which you might have already heard to some extent, probably yesterday. I'm going to focus changing climate uh, or, and Sundarbans and try to link up, are we able to actually quantify the change in climate uh, using biodiversity uh, signals? and what it means for the communities, the coastal communities. Uh, this morning we saw a very moving documentary, actually quite a few number of great documentaries uh, we have uh, uh, listened to, we have watched, and uh, in one of those documentaries on Ghoramara Island, you know, uh, the communities are really reeling from the pressure of changing climate. So as scientists, as practitioners of science, what we can do to improve uh, them? or improve their livelihood. 
ancient civilization have prospered uh, over thousands of years either near the bank of major rivers or estuaries or near the coastlines. And all of these ancient civilizations have exchanged cultural thoughts, materials, uh, ideas, science, through the ocean. Therefore, ocean is pivotal to the ancient civilization and also the modern civilization. Without the ocean, the modern civilization would be incomplete. And therefore, in modern civilization, modern ocean, we need to look at ocean slightly in a different perspective. We need to look at ocean from the perspective of economy. And we use this terminology, ocean economy. Uh, if you look at it, globally one in ten persons are dependent on the fisheries. And it has been estimated that the potential value of the ocean economy will be 30 trillion US dollars by 2030. When you look at South Asia, most of the countries have coastline and therefore the people who live along the coastlines are directly dependent on the coastal resources. Of course, uh, one of the most important component of this is proteins. There has to be reliable source of proteins in the food they take. And fish protein is, of course, one of the most reliable sources. But over the years, we have been exploiting the coastal fisheries uh, unabated. And therefore, we are facing two big issues. One is rising population. And the second is how do we ensure food security? So, we need to look at ocean from a sustainable viewpoint, and this is the basis of ocean economy. And you look at the right hand, uh, you know, uh, this chart, pie chart, where it clearly shows what are the value added components sector wise that are being generated from the ocean. Therefore, ocean is pivotal uh, to our everyday livelihood. And this is also the basis why United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, have focused on ocean. Goal number 14, if you look at it, life below water is nothing but actually focusing on the ocean. And how do we link 14, 13 with many of the important components such as 1, 2, 3, uh, 5, for example. And of course, if we want to achieve 1, 2, 3, 5, we need to link up 8, 9, 10 more effectively. Uh, so, so these essentially are interlinked and that is the basis why SDG 17 is there, which is the partnership for the goals. And all of this cannot work discreetly, all of these are interconnected. If you take any goal, you will see there is an interconnection is there. And goal number 14 is something which is extremely important. Every country has set up their benchmarks or standards to achieve these goals. And uh, India has also achieved, you know, uh, you know, within the framework quite nicely in some of the goals. Some goals we have challenges and we as a country are working together to achieve that. But globally, the problem is that these 17 goals which have been laid on, uh, they to a sum or to a large extent actually influenced by the changing climate. So the more the climate is changing, the more the impacts are or more difficult is going to become to achieve these goals. So if we want to achieve these goals, we need to relook at the ocean in a slightly different perspective. When we talk about ocean, we tend to forget that ocean should not be looked only from the ocean viewpoint, but we need to look ocean connecting with the land. We need to look ocean connecting or communicating with the atmosphere. We need to look ocean communicating or connecting with the fresh water, which means land, ocean, atmosphere, fresh water interactions are happening. And that is the basis why South and Southeast Asia's are considered to be the hotspot of biological diversity. And essentially, oceanic biological diversity hotspots are there. And these we say, use different terminologies, biotopes, ecosystems, whatever we want to look at it. And as you go, you move from west to east, you will see that this density of the hotspots uh, keeps on changing. And of course, the biodiversity is also changing. Let us look a couple of these hotspots. Uh, for example, the mangrove forest. Here I'm showing you the mangrove forest of Myanmar. The reason is Myanmar mangrove forest we don't know much about. They're very different compared to many other mangroves that we see in South or Southeast Asia because they are 
they have developed along the edges of the continental shelf and they're experiencing very unique geochemical gradients that make them very interesting, yet we do not know anything about it. But at the same time, there is high rate of uh, loss of mangrove cover is happening in the uh, Myanmar coastline. The second example I want to draw your attention to is all of you have heard about Bali Island in uh, Indonesia. But, uh, and here you have got fantastic coral reefs. A coral reef cannot be taken out from the oceanic realm. If the coral reefs are there, the ocean is there, and if the ocean is there, the ocean economy is there. So there, these are interconnected, and these are very rich in uh, biodiversity. And of course, when we want to achieve food security, we tend to then put tremendous amount of pressure on these biotopes, some of which it essentially becomes unsustainable in the long term. But what is very interesting is that the ocean system has a regulatory mechanism in place or a mechanism by which it can recover some of these losses. And one of the systems that works very effectively in the ocean is the microbial loop, where organisms are interacting with each other and ultimately we see the manifestation of that interaction in terms of the fish uh, which we consume. But we don't understand these interacting components very well when we look at the ocean from the viewpoint of land boundary system. That's what we call it as the coastal ocean. And this is extremely important because the land shapes or the land influences the health of the ocean, which has huge consequences for all the UN SDG goals that we are talking about. So this is not to our surprise, this is the Sundarbans mangrove the world's largest contiguous mangrove uh, spread across India and Bangladesh and uh, home to very unique biodiversity, many of which are endemic. And yesterday and today also, I'm sure, uh, we have covered these aspects quite well. If we look at the Sundarbans mangroves, that's something very unique in the sense this mangrove is not very old. It's uh, less than 6,000 years old. Uh, so essentially it has evolved during the late Holocene and uh, the ecosystem has developed to this continuous flow of the fresh water that is flowing from the river Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna system. So we call it the GBM Delta, the Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna Delta. And if we look at the freshwater flow rate, it is around 42,000 cubic meter per second to around 120,000 cubic meter per second during the monsoon time. Probably the fourth highest flow rate of freshwater into the ocean. And in this dynamic system, in this dynamic environment, this huge fluctuation of freshwater that is happening, a mangrove has developed over the years, has evolved, and you know the name Sundarbans comes from the mangrove Sundari. One important aspect of Sundarban is that it happens to have the second highest suspended particulate matter load, which means if you go into the water of Sundarban, you will see that the color is either dark color or brown color or grayish color. Essentially, all the sediment that is coming from the land is deposited here and is keeping on mixing because of this flow and because the system is very, very shallow. And therefore, in this kind of system, you would anticipate that in the aquatic layers, there will not be much of primary production, which means photosynthetic driven production will not be happening. But it's exactly the opposite. You have got a lot of photosynthetic driven production and you have got the terrestrial production that is happening. And this is the basis why it has been considered or been declared as a socio-cultural heritage of our planet, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and very recently it has been declared as a Ramsar uh, wetland or a Ramsar site. So there is more importance being given to the Sundarbans. Now, to a common person, what really Sundarban means? Somebody uh, who is in the district of Bardowan, let's say, who is actively practicing paddy cultivation. What Sundarban means to him or to her? Essentially, if the Sundarbans will not be there, or if we lose these Sundarbans, it will change the climatic pattern. It will have implications on aerosol. Aerosol implication means rainfall shift, which means he or she will not be in a position to practice agriculture. That's how 
the Sundarban is regulating or modulating the regional climatic processes. And one of these processes that happens that ultimately shape the aerosol formation. Shagnik was talking about it this morning in, in a different perspective, health perspective, but in a productivity perspective that because these mangroves are there, there is carbon cycling happening. And because carbon cycling is happening, therefore we have got the monsoonal patterns, which is largely still happening in the region. But of course, it has become erratic due to several reasons. Uh, changing climate is not just the only reason. So therefore, this ecosystem is extremely important. And more so for the livelihood of the 2 million people who are directly dependent on it. You'll be astonished that Sundarbans actually contributes to almost 3% of the total GDP of the South Asian countries. So it's a huge contribution. If this system is being taken out or gets lost, then it will have huge implications, a cascading implications which will happen. And thus, the South Asian coastal countries, their blue economy, that means the economy which is driven, driven by the sea or by the ocean, are dependent on it. We have been hearing about changing climate for a long time, uh, and therefore we also, our research group in Aizar, Kolkata, we also uh, started to look an, into it. We, say, we started to look at it from a biological perspective. And we said that if we want to understand changing climate, you need to look at the microbial loop, because this is the invisible thing that is there. We do not know what is going on, but we know that that is controlling the regional climate processes. And therefore, we said that if we really want to understand if there is any changes going on in this microbial loop, there should be scientifically driven time snapshots of what is really going on in the Sundarbans. And that laid the foundation of the Sundarbans Biological Observatory time series. This is the only mangrove time series of South Asia. Please remember. So that has huge significance. And we set up this time series in Sagar Island. You know, Ghoramara is just out there at the top. Uh, in south of the Sagar Island, we have set up three time points which we have been measuring continuously since 2010 March. And essentially, we are able to go back in 2010 and say what was there in 2010, which is not there in 2022. So these kind of time snapshots are extremely important. Let me show you how it really looks like. It's beautiful, you know. You have got these intertidal mudflats, you have got the mangroves, you have got the blue sky. But believe me, if these three components and that river Muriganga, which is one of the distributaries of the Ganges, is not there, then we will not have the sky as beautiful as we tend to see. In this sediment, there are many processes that are going on which is, is ensuring the rich coastal fisheries that we get benefited from in the Sundarbans. And typically, this is how our sites looks like. During low tide, you know, there's hardly any water. During high tide, there's plenty of water. And I wanted to show you how we look at the changes or the patterns that is going on. This is a plot of simple oscillations in salinity in Sundarbans over the last 10 years, OK? And these oscillations actually tells us that the Sagar Island or the surrounding western part of Sundarbans have become more saline than it was 10 years ago. So there is a change. Now, this kind of change will have huge implications, not only for the western part of Sundarbans, but beyond Sundarbans and throughout the northern Indian Ocean. We also have something called seasonal time series. You know, you have this big set of you know, uh, mangrove cover, almost 9,000 square kilometer. And in the Indian part, you know, the area is much lesser. We have some seasonal time points, those dot dots you are seeing, where we keep on measuring and we try to understand seasonally how the biological communities, how the physical variables, chemical variables, how they're interacting, what makes them interesting. And here is a nice uh, plot, uh, uh, a dense plot, as you can see, of many of the key variables. In row two, if you go to the third figure, row two third figure, because my pointer thing is not working, I am not able to show. But you see, there is a sudden drop in the values. And that is the salinity which is going down suddenly. This is happening in the summer time. What it tells us, there is pulse of groundwater discharge that is happening. That groundwater discharge is changing the salinity, which is driving the productivity. 
you would anticipate that because if the surface water has decreased in terms of uh, evaporation process, it's going to become more saline, but that's not the case. The groundwater is uh, essentially replacing the salinity and driving processes. Second thing, if you look at the top layer, uh, there are some plots of nitrogen. We see that the nitrogen also shows some episodic pattern. Essentially, during certain times of the year, the forms of nitrogen changes. And then these responses are being reflected in the biological communities. Here we have plotted the prokaryotic communities and here we have plotted the eukaryotic communities trying to understand how they are responding to these episodic signals so that we can better estimate the rate of carbon fixation or the carbon utilization which is going on. So this kind of time series are also important. So here we are measuring only in certain times of the year, but the previous one we are measuring throughout the year. And both of these data sets are essential to understand how the changing climate signals are being felt. I'll first give you two quick examples. What is so interesting about Sundarbans beyond what we know of or what we see or perceive? You look at it, if we look at the microbial communities of Sundarbans and we compare with some of the major estuaries of the world. Here we have the Columbia estuary, the Delaware estuary, North America. And then you have got three major estuaries of, of the China, Zhilong estuary, Hangzhou estuary, and the Pearl estuary. All of these three estuaries have mangroves. And we compare, we see that in Sundarbans, you have got very unique population of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. Essentially, these are microbes which are breaking down complex form of carbon. What it really means? In a simple way, if the mangrove is there, so much mangrove litter is falling in the water. How, what is the fate of that litter? These breakdown processes are being mediated by them. So there is something which is very unique in this mangrove which has evolved in course of time. The other example I'll very quickly give you is you've got algal population which are there in the water or even in the intertidal layer or even associated with the pneumatophores. You've got unique signals of uh, mangrove of mangrove algae which exhibit distinct spatiotemporal patterns that have implications on the gray mullet population. We call it in Bengali parse. Okay? This is what is driving, these algae are driving the gray mullet and then this fisherman or the fisherwoman, he or she is able to continue with his or her livelihood. Lipid getting transported into mullet, he or she is catching and ultimately we are the buyers. So essentially if there is a change in climate, these ones is going to change and that is going to impact the mullet population. So, in order to understand that, we need to keep monitoring these systems. This is a fantastic work being undertaken by Arka Prabha Mandal from a research group. He's there. Please do stop by and see his uh, uh, poster, where what he has done is he has actually covered the vertical transect of the Sundarbans, and he started to look at this unique prehistoric microscopic eukaryotes, which we call it as foraminifera, and he started to say that by looking at this foraminifera, can we tell whether the ecosystem is healthy or not, okay? If you have more number of live foraminifera, that means the ecosystem is healthy. If you have less number of live foraminifera, that the ecosystem possibly is going towards a, uh, towards a direction which will not become reversible, so it's irreversible. And he sees that there's a lot of uh, changes that is being reflected. And we are carrying on the same process, not only in Sundarban, in Chilka Lagoon, which is a Ramza site, and in Kakinara Bay, in, in Andhra Pradesh, to understand uh, across the entire northeast to northwest uh, Bay of Bengal of the Indian Ocean how these changes are happening. And during his study, he found out that the Bay of Bengal actually have these regional currents, which we call it as eddies. These eddies are bringing in nutrients that drives the productivity, that ultimately drives the marine bioresources, and for example, habitat of the enigmatic lesser known fauna, such as the mangrove horseshoe crab, which appeared on this planet 200 million years ago and continues to survive without any change. That's why we call them as living fossil. So this ecosystem is, is, is a home for many of these interactions that is going on out here. 
Not only that, there are unique signals of microbial functional guilds in Sundarbans. And here is one example where we have looked at cyanobacteria and we show that you find groups which are exclusively to Sundarbans and not found in any other place in any other major estuaries or many other major oceans of the world. And that makes it something which is extremely, extremely important. Now, while these things are there, which is unique, or which many of the processes are happening in, in the Sundarbans or in the coastal Bay of Bengal, we cannot run away of the fact that what we could not do in million years of our art system process, we have managed to do, we humans have managed to do in the last 250 years. We have very efficiently managed to change the global surface temperature. And the change in global surface temperature means there is a change in the interaction, the balance, the interaction between land, ocean, atmosphere, which means there are changes in terms of the CO2 concentration. It is the highest in last two million years. Sea level rise fastest in last 3,000 years. Arctic sea ice area has melted its lowest level in 1,000 years. And glaciers are retreating. You look at the Himalaya, you'll see many of the glacial fed rivers, they are changing dramatically. So we have pushed our planet to our area or to a region where probably it's heading towards irreversibility. And you will be, you have heard about last year and this year, two degree commitment, you know, is essentially how do you keep our planet warming restricted to two degrees Celsius, to existing what it is. And there is so much discussion is on, ongoing and no uh, understanding has been reached and that was the basis of the COP26 meeting of last year. So if on these signals, on these threats, we take it, uh, essentially what we have is a multiple stressor environment. We call it as anthropogenic stressors in a changing climate. What do I mean by that? We have changed the climate. Now we are polluting our ecosystems. And, uh, and the implications of that are that there are huge changes happening in the land, freshwater, ocean, atmosphere interaction, which means there are two types of impacts are happening. One is short-term impact and the second one is long-term impact. Now, if we are to reduce this impact, we have to do two important things immediately. One is invest and the second thing is innovate. Okay? And this invest is a big issue which we call it as ocean financing. People want to invest money where? Where there is return. Now, if you want to invest money in ocean, return risk is much, much higher. So ocean financing is not a big thing. You know, it's something that is being discussed. Whatever ocean financing is happening is happening only at the philanthropic level. It's not happening in any other level. It's not happening. There is no angel investor is there, no equity, nothing is there. So we are at this crossroad where we need huge investment and there is no shortage of innovation. Why? Because we need both of these to work in tandem to solve or to tackle this problem. And why this is important? Because we want to achieve a condition, something called sustainable ocean. To achieve sustainable ocean, we have to invest very heavily because, and we can only do that when we understand these components more integrative manner. I give you now a quick example, the kind of changes that we see from the biological perspective, which might be driven due to changing climate or implications of anthropogenic stressors. Sundarbans is becoming more rich in nutrient than it has been in the last 100 years. There is more anthropogenic nitrogen that is flowing into the Sundarban than it has been in the last 75 years. And therefore, our ecosystem is becoming more and more rich in nitrogen, which means only specialized group of microbes can survive and thrive. thrive. You might know them as opportunist uh, in, in your book. And when they start to thrive, it will lead to a situation called microbial bloom. This is very different from algal bloom. Microbial bloom means there will be loss of oxygen, dramatic loss of oxygen, because this is heterotrophic driven process, which means it will have huge impact on the fish, uh, juveniles, the fingerlings we call it, the prawn seeds, everything it will be affected. So we urgently need to intervene and reduce the rate of anthropogenic nitrogen. And the implications of that has been also failed beyond microbial level. If you look at, we see more incidents of harmful algal bloom 
happening and he is uh, uttam da uttam is one of our more trust most trusted guide he is the one who knows more about sundarbans than we do and he tells us that when he was a child and now that he is being practicing and living in sundarbans things have changed dramatically and one of the things that we see is in sundarbans you now have more jellyfish entering into the sundarban so there is this bloom of jellyfish which is happening why because they are getting food which was not there in the sundarbans before because of the changing climate it is changing so which means we are staring at a scenario what we call it as gelatinous ocean our oceans are going to be full of jellyfish now with this problem we have to find a solution what is the solution the solution is let us use jellyfish as a bio resource you know in vietnam people use jellyfish so actually we have to train ourselves to make the best use of the developing scenarios that we have in the sundarbans and not only that we are seeing more prevalence of coal adapted diatoms diatoms which are found in the cold waters we are finding in sundarbans they are live and they are thriving which means these populations are adapting into this uh, dynamic situation but what it would mean in the long term is something which is not very clear the third thing we want to do or we should keep an eye on is we have to do surveillance of our environment of the sundarbans and this surveillance has to be robust it cannot be a shallow surveillance so one example of this i'm showing you where we are using high throughput sequencing to do the surveillance to understand what is the type of antibiotic resistance genes and metal resistance genes that we are finding in sundarbans and believe me we are not restricting it restricting it to sundarbans we are actually have going upstream you know throughout the river ganges we are monitoring this so we know as you go down and down where the density of population is higher we are seeing more ergs and more ergs means there is a potential problem the problem is these ergs can be moved around between the microbes and we can end up with a scenario where we can have a pathogenic microbe evolving in this kind of system which could have huge human implications and of course implications in terms of bioresources so we have taken this work forward and now we have in the process of advanced stages of establishing south asia's first mangrove mobile genomics laboratory mbgl and this is being generously funded by the packard uh, foundation of united states of america the edna collaborative of united states of america and government of india ministry of education where we are going to monitor the mangroves of south asia try to understand how widespread are these ergs metal resistance genes and what it would mean from for for uh, for us in terms of health and society and this image is a very nice example where you have now got a sequencing tool which you can actually run it in your in our own hand it's very cost effective and we can run it in in this kind of uh, you know uh, boat very easily so this work is ongoing at the moment and we should have it up and running by the end of this year i go very quickly because i know time is running out i go very quickly to one of the most important component i believe microplastic in coastal ocean we are polluting our environment left and right with no conscience let me say it very blunt and the effect of that is so much microplastic is getting dumped into our ocean you look at it annual flow of plastic carbon into the global carbon cycling has been estimated to be 280 to 360 mmt this is phenomenal volume and amount you are talking about it will take hundreds and thousands of years to break many of these plastics and which will have huge implications so we are also looking into it what kind of common plastics we find in sundarbans and here is one example you look at the top lane images mostly nylon fishing nets ghost nets and believe me these ghost nets are causing immense damage to the biodiversity uh, left hand image showing horseshoe crab being caught and the right one is indo pacific finless porpoise which got entangled in the ghost net okay and you know there are examples are there by now now we have found actually in our blood there is plastic and fetuses have plastic so actually you know we are we we have made sure that we reach the end of the uh, of this anthropocene in some way but what we are doing is we are taking slightly different approach we are being funded by the nippon foundation under the back to blue initiative where we are characterizing this fiber fragment and plastic polymers uh, this is also a work being undertaken by nirupama from our research group she is doing phd and we have put in a new angle to it we are doing geotagging of the plastic 
That means the place and point from where we collected the plastic, we not only characterize, we tag them and we put the GPS position into a database so that we know what is the source and the fate of the pl plastic. That means the plastic might have originated in Thailand, might wash up in the shore of West Bengal. It's, everything is possible and it has happened, by the way. Last, I go very quickly, uh, which Shagnik pointed to out in some way or other, was the CO2 emission. What is the implication of emission of the CO2 uh, in terms of the biology and the health of the ocean? We have a scenario, something called the coastal ocean acidification. This is a reality. Our ocean pH is changing much faster. It has been in the last 500,000 years of our planet. And the implications of the changing ocean means the ocean biodiversity is going to change and ocean processes are going to change. And you look at the right hand image, to, uh, extreme right hand image is essentially this blue color indicates that we do not know what is going to be the fate for Bay of Bengal, the coastal Bay of Bengal. And we have done some modeling work, some satellite work, in situ measurements, trying to understand what it really means. But what we are not sure is what is going to happen to this rich, unique bioresources that we find in the coastal oceans such as Sundarbans. So to understand this, to take this forward, we are very pleased to set up the South Asia Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification. All the South Asian countries beyond South Asia, we have Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia as observer status. And I'm very pleased to tell you, Oman, Maldives have joined as observer, observer status in this hub. This is being funded by the UNESCO, endorsed by the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Global Ocean Observation Network. The, the hub office is located in our institute. And the idea is to practice uniform method of carbon measurements in the South Asian water, understand the biological implications uh, following a common benchmark so that we can ultimately understand what it means for blue economy, for the livelihood and beyond. So I welcome all of you to join this network and contribute your expertise. Please write to me when you can. I end up with a last snippet. I could not resist. I think the boss has already spoken. Shagnik already spoke. But I am a student. I want to show you one interesting data. We have been measuring aerosol. Uh, in the coastal Sundarban. And here you see two examples, November 27 aerosol data, PM 2.5, and December 27 aerosol data, PM 2.5. And you clearly see that the AD covariance has changed, which means the air temperature and the land temperature has changed, and as a result, that the aerosols are actually being stuck and hovering around. And these aerosols are getting deposited in the coastal water of Sundarban. And ultimately, many of the organisms are taking it as an opportunity to utilize it. The implications of what we see it as harmful algal bloom. And here is one example where a, where a diatom, which we have identified and established, has extensive nitrogen and iron acquisition pathways. These iron acquisition pathways can be only present when there is enough labile form of iron is there. It is not there in the Sundarban in labile form. It is there in the forms of li lig ligand, essentially. So only way it can come is this iron, which is being transported by the aerosol. And we see that this is something which could become a potential problem. We are investigating that. Uh, now to the last part of my, of my discussion. How do we monitor Sundarban? Okay? We have to monitor Sundarban by deploying sensors. And sensors need to be cost effective, but should be very good in terms of deep science. And we are developing sensors. We are deploying these sensors. These are examples where we have deployed sensors. We are collecting vital data, such as pH, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, depth of the water, so that we can effectively model the kind of interaction uh, between the estuarine water and the atmosphere and the changing climate to ultimately develop good models which can tell us what is going to be the fate of Sundarbans in next 25 years, 50 years, and uh, 100 years. Why? We don't want this kind of scenario. This is a, a recent image after the cyclone Amphan. Uh, in coastal part of the Sagar Island where a freshwater pond has been converted or has been damaged due to salinity in intrusion. And this is going to remain like that. People have left this area and went away. And it has got huge implication for the communities. Believe me, they have lost their livelihood. They have to come up with new uh, training mechanisms for li livelihood. And here is one example. After the Amphan, uh, the seeds were supplied to fisher folks because there's immense amount of damage uh, 
uh, was there. And then there's this problem, uh, the, the huge problem that we had of the COVID. So it's a big, big issue that was developing during uh, that time. So how do we tackle this? How do you take your science to society? I'm very pleased to tell you that we have just established or installed South Asia's first mangrove rod surface elevation table uh, benchmark R set in the mangroves of Sundarbans. And this is going to tell us how much expansion and compaction of the sediment of Sundarban is happening. And then it can tell us about the rise in sea level. That this is an international initiative supported by Aizar Kolkata uh, Center for International Forestry Research of Indonesia, Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, and the US aid of the United States. So we are hoping to take our science to society and ultimately help to tell us or help develop models that can tell us the true estimate of rising sea level in the Sundarban. Now, why do we all do all of these things? Why this conference? Why you are all here? The reason is we want to see the impact to be positive. Positive impact has to happen. We cannot ignore the importance of biodiversity contribution to GDP. We cannot ignore the importance of life below water, the significance in terms of sustainable pollution. But we cannot run away from the multifaceted stressors, the ocean pollution we are, we are dealing with. To tackle this, we need to essentially create opportunities. And when we create opportunities, we can tackle and address sustainable development goals through innovation. And that is where we all aim to work on and contribute in the long run. This is one example we are doing. We are, what we have learned so far, we are translating into societal benefit. We are in the process of finalizing and setting up the first you know, water filtration system, which is run biologically. Uh, you know, it's going to produce about 10 to 15,000 liters of water per day, uh, potable water. Why it is required? If there is a cyclone, there will be inundation of seawater. This is going to help to tackle this in the long run. And nature-based solution, uh, uh, we following to recover the mangroves. I'm very pleased to inform that your alumni, uh, Amrita Maiti from your college, she is looking into how we can restore the mangroves, not by putting mangrove seedlings, but by actually tackling the partially damaged uh, mangrove vegetation and how do you revive them. So this is a geobiometrics approach that we are tackling uh, or we want to undertake in the long run. Now, the question is, why do you want to do all these things? We want to do this because our agenda is straightforward. We all are here to see our environment, our ocean to be sustainable. Why do we want our environment and ocean to be sustainable? Because we cannot deny changing climate is actually affecting many of the small island developing states, the fishery developing states, which are vulnerable. And unless and until we tackle this, we cannot be the role model and cannot transform the direction. So we have a big role to play uh, in the long run. And I would like to thank my institution, Aizar Kolkata, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, Ministry of Arts and Government of India, Shornojanti Fellowship of the Science and Engineering Research Board, the MSME of Government of India, WWF India, WTI Wildlife Trust of India, Forest Department of the Government of West Bengal, uh, organizers of this fantastic uh, conference that you have organized, you have brought all of us together. And last but not the least, I thank my entire research group members. You know, here you can see uh, Dr. Annesha Ghosh, Arka Prabhamandal, he's looking through the field microscope. We have got Prashun who is measuring the uh, microplastic along with Roni. Uh, you have got Gaurav who is looking at human gut microbiome and diabetes too. You have got Nirupama in the middle row of the second layer, looking at microplastics. Yash, looking at integrated mangrove aquaculture. Chakresh, looking at what is the effect of freshwater system on the Sundarbans and beyond. You have got Amrita, looking at who is out here, looking at the effect of the, uh, how we can develop or, or how you can look at the effect of the pollution on the mangroves and, and in terms of recovery of the mangrove. And last but not the least, a very energetic BSMS student of our institute who is working with us to develop the cost-effective sensors. Thank you all very much for your uh, patience and time. And I very much look forward to any question, thought, intervention that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vaduri, for your enlightening and revealing lecture uh, <clears throat> regarding this uh, ocean economy, uh, how to look at the ocean from 
sustainable viewpoint. What are the oceanic biological hotspots, as you have mentioned, regarding the mangrove forest in Myanmar, uh, Sundarban mangrove, as you have mentioned about the microbial loop in coastal ocean, the importance of Sundarbans in climatic, in regulating climatic processes, how Sundarban can contribute, or rather contributes to the total world's GDP, and regarding the real problem that we are facing with the microplastic in coastal ocean, emission of carbon dioxide which leads to, well, which is leading to acidification of the ocean, and that can lead to changes in ocean diversity. How sensors may be used to monitor Sundarbans, and how to translate science to the societal benefits. So uh, you pointed out all these things. It was such an uh, enthralling lecture. So I think the floor is open to questions. It will be nice if we can have some questions, particularly from the students. said that improvement of mangrove. Now, repeatedly I, I could see that the cyclones are coming and the mangroves are getting destroyed. So what actually, what you are trying to do, is it improvement through microbial supplementation or something like that? Thank you, sir. All the, I think all the questions are very relevant. Um, Yes, I think you know the amount of microplastic and nanoplastic that is there in the Sundarban estuaries, uh, that is definitely ending up in the zooplankton. Uh, we we are not working on it, but we know there are groups who are working on it, and they are seeing examples of that in the zooplankton gut, essentially. So that there's no doubt about it. The challenge is nanoplastics are very difficult to determine. So they are much, much smaller in size compared to the microplastics. So that's where the biggest problem is. So the extent can be extent of the problem can be several fold higher. Now your bigger question is very important, I think. You know, uh, I think there is a trend in, in the north, global north, to blame the global south. You know, all the bad deeds of global north, 150 years of industrial revolution that you're talking about, you know, that has contributed to this entire CO2 enigma that you are dealing with, okay? And now the gun has been, you know, put towards India and China. That now you are, because you have biggest population, hence you're emitting more CO2. But the irony is, if you look at the CO2 emission rate per capita, actually India is far lower than many of the so-called developed countries. That's one thing. Same thing also stands with plastic, you know. The amount of plastic generated per person, Australia has the highest. And India is way down, down below, actually, you know, in among the Asian countries. Uh, now, these plastics that we are seeing, of course, a significant portion of it is coming from the land. There's no doubt about it. And these are essentially uh, adjacent land. So you're talking about like big cities and other major cities or townships. But we must not forget that we are talking about ocean means there are ocean currents. And ocean current means they are transporting plastic from one end to another, another place. So this is definitely happening. We have um, evidences that it is happening. And that is the reason why the geotagging approach helps us to understand that, essentially. And you know the beauty is technology, the artificial intelligence is such a powerful tool, right? We, you know, image, and I think there is a software or a tool is there. I don't remember exact name, but essentially when you play that it is embedded in any phone you have. It, it searches against the closest images and it tells you the origin of the image, where from it is. And such simple tools can be very effectively integrated to map and understand the origin of this plastic. So I think we are dealing with a multifaceted problem and I think the biggest problem in a changing climate is going to be in the next 50 years is going to be plastic than uh, anything else. And your last part, sir, because Amrita has started the work and uh, our approach is take a microbial matrix approach. And we believe that if you can improve the microbial matrix, the mangroves can withstand and recover. You know, 
a 100 meter width of the mangrove can reduce the wave energy by 70 percent. So you think the tremendous amount of force it is actually taking in. And it has got the potential to deal with it. We just need to help it. Why? Because we have altered many of the other things because of our greed. So we just have to help and I think uh, we believe that microbe is going to be an important player and therefore we have used the term geobiometrix to solve this problem and again that's what Amrita is going to do and we'll know that whether really the concepts actually work in the long run or not. Thank you sir. Any other question? One question yes. I, uh, I came to know the, from the internet that uh, Caterpillar digests the plastics. Can we find in the marine life any digestive creature to digest the uh, microplastics or something like that? Because it's become a very threat to our human life. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very uh, interesting question. Yes, there are some bacteria there which has shown which have shown ability to break down plastic. Okay. Now the the, the problem is, as SAR is already there, you know, SAR can tell on the other side of the dais that plastic is not a simple thing. It's essentially you're looking at different forms of chemical signals or, or, or chemical structures. And when you're talking about those chemical structures, you're essentially saying, when I'm saying something is able to break, the question should be which one? Is it PVC? Is it polyethylene? Or is it the ones which have a longer residence time? Essentially, breakdown is next to impossible or very slow. So some bacteria can break down, but unfortunately these are the most the common polymers, not the most complex ones. And I think that's where uh, it's going to be very important. The other thing is we do not know, I at least don't know whether there are any other organisms are there, which just like the example that you give, you have given, which, are, which can do it, but maybe possible it is doing it, it's just a matter of time when we can figure that one out. The bacteria will be? Yeah, the bacteria already has necessary enzymes which can break down that. It's, it's actually it, it not because of the plastic. They already had that in the genetic circuit or machinery. It's just that they're able to break down that particular form of uh, chemical signal or the chemical metabolite that you are talking about. Yeah. But I think it's a long way. We'll see how things evolve. Yeah. Yeah, you are right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the process may be kinetically slow. You don't Absolutely, know. Absolutely, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, next question. Uh, so I have a, uh, my question is very naive maybe. So since you have talked about the nutrient flux and the metal flux in the Sundarban region, and since uh, we know that maybe that can also affect the microbial community, right? And since you are doing so much of metagenomic uh, NGS uh, studies, so I'm just curious whether have you already seen or whether you have plans of seeing that how this nutrient of metal flask is actually influencing the microbial flask and in turn influencing the uh, metal uptake or translocation in the mangroves. Because, you know, if they are in the uh, fruits of the mangroves which are being consumed or maybe used as medicinal purposes by the natives, so maybe that can affect their lives also. So if you can shed some light on that. That's, that's a very pertinent question. Uh, we, we do, we do uh, a validation, we call it as mesocosm experiment, okay? Essentially, you mimic the condition which is happening in the coastal water and you try to mimic under laboratory condition. Of course, you can't mimic the ocean. It's impossible. But you mimic some of the important conditions. And we have, we use two kinds of approaches. One is a microcosm in small scale and one is mesocosm which is huge scale. Essentially, volume of water is changing. Uh, we are talking about 1,000 liters to 10 liters. That's the kind of, you know, uh, variability. And there, what we have done is we have spiked many of these metals, only the most important one that we think. For us, we think iron is going to be the biggest thing, okay? Uh, availability of iron is changing. So we have spiked that and we see that there are opportunistic groups are, uh, are there in the water which are able to change themselves, able to grow. Now the question is, we can only deduce so much conclusion from those kind of experiments because these are controlled experiments. The system is controlled, it's not dynamic in that sense. And therefore, we have to be very, very cautious the kind of conclusions that we can draw. That's one thing. Second thing is, we must not forget that almost all of these organisms have evolved in the history of the earth. 
you have you had a reduced environment now you have got a redox environment so they have the innate ability to deal with different forms of metals and different concentration of metals so and these are happening in tandem essentially so when we are looking at a particular metal we may not be able to understand that or, or we may not have the enough strength to decode what it really means and i end up saying is that we are also doing something called stable isotope measurements which we have not shown out here where we are trying to understand what kind of anthropogenic uh, sources of nitrogen or carbon those are and and that we want to mimic it when we do the metal a spike experiment but i think it's in early days and there's a long way to go uh, you know i i end saying you know 10 years ago the entire global community was really charged we are going to tackle climate change how by carbon capture mechanism how we make our ocean fertilize the ocean ocean fertilization experiment billions of dollars were used iron was dumped essentially to hope that you know there will be algal bloom and then you remove the co2 essentially capture blue carbon if you can say the other term is but these have not worked why ocean circulation is the biggest deterrent so it tells you that 300 years of ocean research is still after that we do not know anything essentially about the oceans and we are dealing with the most complex process that we ourselves have generated so we god save us and we need to save ourselves thank you so much thank you thank you sir i think there is there are no more questions so please come we have arrived at the conclusion of an extremely enriching discussion taking in all the valued learnings from this session we are immensely grateful to the honorable speaker dr punya shlok bhaduri for providing us with his scholarly insights we would also like to take this opportunity and thank our respected session chair dr sanjeev ganguly for sparing his valuable time to conduct this session with efficiency and perfection We also thank our wonderful audience who have cooperated with us, shared their valuable insights, and made this session successful. Please let us give a round of applause for our respected speaker and chairperson. Thank you. We now move forward to our next event lined up for this evening: poster presentation, which is being held at the Big Parlor. We hope to see you all. after the tea break at 5 pm for the next session